Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 14406 in the name of Liam Kerr on free school meals for all primary pupils. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would warn the uh, Chamber there is no time in hand and therefore members will have to stick to their speaking allocation. And I call on Liam Kerr to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes. Mr Kerr. A very grateful, presiding officer. Well, how times change. Remember in 2015, when the then First Minister promised to completely close the attainment gap? Now this government simply aspires to reduce it. Then there were the current First Minister's warm words stating eradication of child poverty would be the single greatest priority for this government. Yet last week's debate highlighted that not only has the child poverty rate remained largely unchanged since 2007, but the SNP's multiple failures were having a detrimental impact. Now I bring this up because of another promise, the one in the SNP's 2021 manifesto. Over the course of the next parliament, we will make sure no child is hungry in the classroom by providing free school breakfasts and lunches to every primary school pupil all year round. Yet last week, we heard the provision will only be to P6 and P7 pupils whose families are in receipt of the Scottish child payment. Let's be very clear what that means. Uh, not just now, Monica Lennon, I will take you later. Last week, John Swinney confirmed he was scrapping the SNP pledge to introduce universal free school meals for P6 and P7 pupils in this parliament. Promise made, promise broken. And here's the issue. We know that the Scottish Government has never seriously tried to close the attainment gap. It doesn't know how to, nor has it forensically worked out what the interventions are that are required. But everyone, everyone knows our kids need food to be ready to learn. The Children's Commissioner said it yesterday. Going to school hungry is not only a barrier to learning and educational achievement, but it can severely impact development in childhood and into adulthood. And when it comes to eradicating child poverty, this decision will set back that mission, as the government has been told by Save the Children, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Child Poverty Action Group. Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Liam Kerr. I welcome his motion. I hope the whole Parliament will back it today. We now know that all primary school pupils in Wales and London have universal free school meals because it's been made a political priority. Does Liam Kerr agree that the SNP needs to drop the spin and the excuses in the amendment we've seen today and put the needs of Scotland's children first? Liam Kerr. I absolutely do agree with that. I think that's a really good point well made because the amendment that we've seen today is as predictable as it is shameful and indeed ignorant. On the 5th of September, in this very chamber, in a rare moment of self-awareness, John Swinney said, we will not be able in this parliamentary term to roll out the eligibility on a universal basis across primary six and seven pupils because our budget has been eroded by fiscal mismanagement. Hasn't it just? You see, presiding officer, this government is sitting on the largest cash terms block grant in devolution history. And as Monica Lennon says, this government makes choices about how it spends that budget. Never forget that the SFC just said last week the SNP's financial woes were largely the result of their own spending incontinence. And nowhere can I find an official costing for the extension. So to assist, I've done a very rough calculation. I think the cost to deliver free school meals for P6 and P7 would be at worst around £110 million. Now, in breaking its promise, the government chooses not to cover that. But what choices has this government made instead? Well, there are the £400 million on ferries, of course, but no one will forget the figures released in July showing Nicola Sturgeon's SNP spent more than £180 million on spin doctors, foreign trips and hospitality. By total coincidence, £110 million of that was spent on press officers, social media and internal communications. And, of course, just last week we heard about the SPADs costing millions. Then there are the more than 120, uh, 120 ministers overseas trips in the last two years to more than 30 different destinations, despite, of course, foreign affairs being reserved to Westminster. Maybe 
It was to visit the nine Scottish Government overseas offices, which cost nine million, or to get away from the 16 million on losses and special payments by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, or perhaps it was to get away from the 82.95 million in last year's consolidated accounts for losses and special payments. And if its priorities were after, some may have missed that Angus Robertson's budget of £347 million, you know, that portfolio that covers things like external affairs, constitution, things that aren't actually devolved, was spared the axe in last week's Finance Secretary Cull. <laughs> Interestingly, for those who worry that £110 million is a lot for this government to find, Shona Robertson, when asked why she hadn't cut that £347 million budget, said, it is a small budget by comparison. Oh. Presiding officer, by axing the universal rollout of free school meals in primary schools, the SNP have shamefully betrayed Scotland's poorest pupils. They've abandoned any pretense that they know how to eradicate the attainment gap and or child poverty. And they have played fast and loose with the trust that the people of Scotland invested in them. You know, when the Scottish Conservatives first pledged to introduce free school meals for all primary school pupils in September 2020, we were supported by all parties across this Parliament. Because some things are just more important than party politics. Just two months later, John Swinney, then Education Secretary, himself announced that this would be SNP policy. So, President Officer, I call on MSPs from all parties to put the party politics aside today and let's send the strongest possible message to the SNP that they cannot, no, they must not abandon the young people of Scotland. Let's back the rollout of free school meals for all primary pupils in this Parliament by voting for the motion in my name that I hereby move. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I now call on Jenny Ruth to speak to and move Amendment 14406.3. Cabinet Secretary, uh, up to five minutes, please. Presiding Officer, last night I met with the World Schools debating champions at Butte House, and Team Scotland were represented by Portobello High School, St Columbus High School, uh, school from Kilmacombe. Broxburn Academy and Dollar Academy and I want to put on the record my congratulations as Education Secretary to them on their success and I am sure that the Parliament sends them our best wishes too. Now Liam Kerr in his contribution says that some things are just more important than party politics and I agree. And I told the young people last night about the topic at hand for today's debate. I explained that it would be a challenging day for the government because we do not disagree on the principle of the motion in front of us. And indeed, as the motion recounts, the SNP committed to deliver universal free school meals in the 2021 election. And I want to put on record our recommitment today to that delivery, because I believe emphatically in the principle of universality as a politician and as a teacher, I know hungry children cannot learn. Now, what the amendment in my name seeks to do is to provide the necessary financial context to the situation we find ourselves in today. And let us be in no doubt that more children in Scotland today are receiving free school meals thanks to this government. Every child in primaries one to five, yeah. special schools, as well as all eligible pupils from primary six right up to S6. Free school meal provision in Scotland is saving families on average £400 per child per year. And in total, Scottish Government funding is providing free school meals to over 270,000 children every single year from those primaries one to five. And we are very much now focusing our efforts on those pupils in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, which will see an additional 26,000 children benefit. But I understand the deep disappointment that universal rollout to primary six and seven has been delayed. And frankly, I share that disappointment. So it is that, in that spirit that I will listen to and engage with the opposition today. Now, presiding officer, Parliament heard from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance only last week the full extent of the budgetary challenges faced by the Scottish Government. And as Sir Keir Starmer has stated on the issue of free school meals, the money is a big factor. I won't shy away from it. The Prime Minister is right. And of course, it is a painful matter of fact that under the current devolution settlement, in the absence of any clarity on additional consequentials, any emerging in your costs have to be funded by cuts from elsewhere. Happy to do so. Kerr, briefly. 
grateful. I, I, I share her deep disappointment in the Scottish Government's decisions, but can the Cabinet Secretary help us understand what representations did she make to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to say, don't take it out of my budget? Cabinet Secretary. I made strong representations to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, and if the member is interested, he can speak to her directly about that matter. But we are presiding officer in a parliament of minorities, and this question is not really one reserved for the First Minister, nor for I as Education Secretary. So how do we fund the approximate £256 million funding gap that I am presented with in order to deliver universality in this parliamentary term? Now, right now, the government simply does not have the resources to deliver it. So I want to hear alternatives from where I should draw the additionality that I need. Now, Pam Duncan Glancy makes an intervention. I'm conscious of time, presiding officer. I'd like to make some progress, but I'm going to name Pam Duncan Glancy here because she has actually reassured me here over Twitter that the cavalry are en route. But I can't really accept a tweet from Ms Duncan Glancy as confirmation of the extent of the consequential Scotland will receive from London. Those who hold the purse strings have offered me no such confirmation. And as the Scottish Fiscal Commission, Liam Kerr quoted, have noted, there is significant uncertainty on the level of funding we will receive from the UK Government ahead of the UK Government's budget on the 30th of October. I have limited time left. So I would welcome confirmation today from any Labour MSP in the Chamber on the totality of consequentials which they expect to flow to Scotland from the new UK Labour Government. And we know that the combined capital and revenue cost of universal expansion, as I referenced earlier, will total an amount of £256 million. So my question to Parliament today is simple, presiding officer, but particularly to the Labour Party. Where would you find the, the money? Because, like their friends, of course, in the Conservative Party, the Labour Party has opposed just about every revenue-raising measure this government has put in place. And just like the Tories, they want us to slash taxes on higher earners, leaving us with less money to invest in our public services. So what is the answer, presiding officer? If they were to commit to the immediate universal expansion in primary schools, which the Scottish Futures Trust independent research estimates will cost £256 million, then what £256 million of cuts will they make? Will they make it elsewhere in our schools? Additional support needs provision, the school clothing grant, the Scottish Attainment Challenge? Would they stop funding to the eight new schools which are being built? Would it be cuts elsewhere? Would it be the NHS childcare, the Scottish child payment? Or would they do what they've been desperate to do since 2007 and reimpose tuition, tuition fees, fees on Scottish yeah, students? Because that is the reality, presiding officer. Austerity is a political choice. It matters not one iota whether red or blue. The result is less money for Scotland, less money for education and less money for our children. In a parliament of minorities, it is incumbent on the government to engage with the opposition on the facts. So I will be listening today with the interests of Scotland's children and young conclude. people at the forefront of my mind. If you could move the amendment. If you could move the amendment, please. Oh, I move the amendment in my Thank mind. you very much indeed. I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to and move amendment 14406.2 up to four minutes. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to open this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour today and to speak in support of the motion and the amendment in my name, which I move. I've said this before, but it is worth repeating. Education is a great leveller. It can smash the glass, class and step ceilings in the way of opportunity, and any barrier to the full potential and power of it is a barrier to that opportunity for Scotland's young people. Sadly, though, with their litany of broken promises and incompetence in delivery, one such barrier to opportunity in Scotland is the SNP Scottish Government. The Government have now promised but not delivered free school meals for every primary school pupil for four years. Whilst child poverty is stagnant on their watch, people across Scotland will be baffled at the choices they have made. Experts are too. The Children's Commissioner said, any rollback or dilution can only be seen as a broken promise. CPAC said, the Government are falling behind on actions they have already committed to and that families desperately need. And Children First said, they are deeply concerned that the drastic cuts to public spending will throw many children and families already in crisis over the edge. And it's not just lunches, it's breakfasts too. As the Chief Executive of Magic Breakfast pointed out last week, despite being the Minister who announced it, John Swinney is now the third First Minister in a row to exclude universal breakfast provision from the programme for government. Alone, broken promises to young people on food would be bad enough, but they're not. In 2007, the SNP promised to cut class sizes to 18. They abandoned that promise in 2009, and primary classes haven't been below 23 whilst they've been in power. 
The SNP manifesto in 21 promised an increase in teachers and classroom assistants. Teacher numbers have fallen, and in Glasgow alone, against this Parliament's will, 450 might go. The same manifesto promised to reduce contact time for teachers, but a recent Government Commission report found that they won't do this either. And it doesn't stop there. Pledging to end the digital divide, John Swinney announced that in 2021, if elected, every child in Scotland would get a digital device. This was dropped this year. Then there's the free bikes. And this year, Transport Scotland confirmed just over 6,000 bikes have gone out, out of approximately 250,000 children in poverty. And on the 11th of June, the First Minister said, and I quote, where families have debts about free school meals, we have written those off. But families are still being pursued, and the government can't tell us how many families that they have written off. Presiding officer, thousands of Scotland's children and young people who were promised all of this by this government have now left school. This matters, not least because people are sick of being promised stuff they don't get, but because broken promises to young people impact education and stifle opportunity. Because of the SNP's litany of broken promises and incompetence, Attainment is down and the gap is up. Fewer young people are in jobs, education or training after leaving school. I'm sorry, I don't have time this afternoon. And young people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds are five times more likely to be unemployed. These aren't just numbers. They are young people denied opportunity. Scotland's once world-renowned education system is on its knees 17 years after this government's mismanagement, and they can't keep blaming someone else. So I have to say I find the government's amendment and the contribution from the Cabinet Secretary today to be tiresome. People watching are tired of excuses not for not delivering the things that they said they would do. They, can't, they can point the fingers all they like, but people in Scotland see the missed opportunities for reducing child poverty incompetence and waste that's cost us £5 billion, and they can hear the experts when they, when they tell them this is because of their own spending decisions. Presiding officer, in closing, it is clear that the path to change does not and cannot lie with this incompetent SNP government. It must fall to these benches who are already delivering to reduce poverty through a new deal for working people, create jobs in GB Energy and improve, and improve finances for working people. That is the change Scotland needs. That is the change young people deserve. And that is the change we will deliver. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call uh, Ross Greer up to four minutes. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I should start by thanking the Conservatives, not just for using some of their time this afternoon uh, to debate free school meals, but because both of their debates this afternoon, both topics, are a defence of green policies from the Butte House Agreement era. I am delighted that our Conservative colleagues, having spent so long trying to bring down the Butte House Agreement, are now the first to defend the legacy of having Greens in government. And I will try to be collegiate presiding officer, um, but I do need to start off by making the point that there's more than a whiff of hypocrisy here to have the Conservatives talking about ways that we can tackle child poverty. The single biggest driver of child poverty in modern British history is the Conservative Party. It's the decisions the Conservative Party have made, whether it's introducing the two child cap, slashing universal credit, decimating public services, this is the choice. You can't pick and choose when you want to lift children out of poverty and when you want to push more children into it without accusations of hypocrisy being flung at you. But on to that point of collegiality and, and consensus. I actually want to talk first about a visit that Oliver Mandel and I and, and some other colleagues took last session to a school in Finland, or to multiple schools in Finland, which has had free school meals, universal free school meals, for some time. That was an experience that we all, I think, gained a great deal from, because in that school we saw every pupil, almost every pupil, sitting together, staying in school at lunchtime for a healthy, warm, free meal. And that did a whole range of things. It tackled inequality. It helped those families who needed it, who would have struggled with paying for school meals. It improved attainment, obviously. Hungry children struggle to learn. They struggle to behave. It avoided, it eliminated stigma, because we know even with the best will in the world, even with the most subtle systems of means testing and entitlement, children can find out who is and is not entitled to a free school meal. And even if they don't, those children who would be entitled, who are entitled under our current system, are worried even about members of staff knowing that their family situation means that they're entitled. So no one misses out under a universal system. And it increases social cohesion because all children were eating together. Yes, including the children of families who could afford to pay for meals, but who otherwise would have probably gone out of school at lunchtime. It's a very different culture that is created 
created as a result of that universal provision. Finland is the gold standard. It's all the proof, all the evidence we need that universal provision works. And it's outrageous that here in Scotland and across the UK, we have children sitting in school hungry in one of the richest countries in the history of the planet. I'm proud that the Scottish Greens, through the last budget agreement last session, just a few weeks before the pandemic brought a lot to a halt, managed to secure the government's agreement to immediately expand free school meals universally to primary four and five and then move on to primary six and seven. That was part of a wider package that we worked on together with colleagues in the SNP for example, to cancel school meal debt. The Scottish Greens were the first to uncover the scale of school meal debt in Scotland. We did the research, we campaigned, and then with the support of the Cabinet Secretary and the then First Minister Hamza Youssef, we secured the funding to cancel that debt. You know, this afternoon's debate is a bit odd because we're debating something that we all agree on. The real question is about money. Where I agree with Liam Kerr, it is a question of priorities. His priorities and mine are very different. Um, I do believe that the Greens have proposals for uh, making this financially affordable. For a start, there are ways you can minimise costs around shared catering facilities and timetabling. But the problem I have with a government agreement is that it presents, quite rightly, the scale of austerity uh, delivered by the Conservative Party, not reversed by the uh, Labour Party, as a challenge, absolutely. But it then makes out that this challenge makes it inevitable. It's not inevitable. There are a range of ways that the Scottish Government can save money in year this year. On the capital side, we would freeze spending on trunk roads and motorways expansion. On the revenue side, we would scale back on tax breaks for shooting estates, for example. This is a question of political choice, presiding officer. I want to hear more about the choices that all colleagues would make this afternoon if we do genuinely have a consensus around the priority of delivering this policy. Thank you. I now call Willie Rennie again. Up to four minutes, Mr Rennie. Yeah, Marcus Rashford made a big impact in this whole debate back in 2020 and, and before that. Um, he's had a lasting legacy that's been credited, quite rightly, um, across the United Kingdom. Um, the SNP at that point were victims um, of their own spin and approach to politics. They are now as a result of that. Because at the time, John Swinney sought to exploit that campaign and draw a difference between the Conservative Government in Westminster and the Scottish Government. He said, hunger doesn't take a holiday. Every child, every minute, every school day is incredibly important for learning. And he committed the SNP to delivering this promise. By August 2022, 2022, two years ago, they promised to deliver that. But they clearly didn't have a costed plan because it was evident from almost the point that they agreed and they put it in the manifesto, they were retreating from that commitment. They blamed initially local authorities for being unable to deliver it in 2022. Then they blamed the Westminster government. Now they're blaming the Labour government, even though they've only been in power for a few weeks, as opposed to the 17 years um, of the SNP government. So they hunted around almost from the very beginning for an explanation an excuse for why they failed to deliver that solemn promise that they put in the manifesto in 2021. And it was clear at that point, because we heard from the Finance Committee, we heard from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, we've been hearing from them for years about the looming financial crisis at the heart of the Scottish Government. And they refused to accept that, and they made endless promises, jumping on headlines, jumping on headlines that have been created by Marcus Rashford, quite rightly, but jumping on them without a costed plan. I have no problem with meeting the needs and the desires of the electorate, but the government have to be honest and straightforward from the very beginning, rather than using them as election gimmicks. And we have been challenged today by the Education Secretary where to find the money. Now, um, if she had been at the... Uh, education Committee last week, she would know the answer, because Graham Day knows exactly where all the money is, because apparently he's worked all of this out. He made an agreement with the college unions right across the country, and he told us he didn't have a clue where the finance was going to come from. I suspect he knows everything about the finances of the Scottish Government, and he has the money tucked up his sleeve. So all he needs to do, all she needs to do, is to reach over to Graham Day, and he will have the answer to everything. So we'll take no lectures. We'll take no lectures from the SNP about where to find the money. 
because they play that trick against the opposition every single time. But they know the finances back to front. And if, if they didn't, why did they make this promise in 2021? Surely they would have had a costed plan working out through all the years. Surely they would have known the Conservatives were going to have austerity for years and the successive Labour government was going to be dreadful. Surely they had worked all of that out before they made this promise. But we know that they didn't because they've been fast and loose with the public finances in Scotland, making endless promises that they just simply cannot keep. So today, the Education Secretary has a challenge, because it's quite clear from a colleague, Ross Greer, and from the Conservatives and Labour and ourselves, we'll all be voting against the government's amendment today. So she will lose. So she has to decide how she's going to respond to the will of Parliament, because the will of Parliament is incredibly important, as we've heard from our bosses, our previous First Ministers, over many, many years. So we would expect a statement today from the government as to how they're going to meet this promise. You need to Which conclude. is not only their promise, but it's the government's promise for them to deliver. So we, de we deserve an answer from the government today. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I call first Brian Whittle to be followed by George Adam. Uh, up to four minutes, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I first declare an interest that my eldest daughter is a teacher and she's head of guidance as well as a PE teacher. Presenting officer, I come into Parliament leading with the statement that I thought education was the solution to health and welfare. And I believe that even more now. In fact, as I've said in the Chamber many times, I think education should be the cornerstone of every portfolio. However, the biggest disappointment I have in this Parliament is the Scottish Government's failure to drive the changes in education and in health that it could have done, given that these portfolios are entirely within the Scottish Government's control. They could have been bold, taken their own path and delivered solutions to some of the country's biggest issues. But they seem content to stumble along behind the crumbling excuse that it's not their fault. We need more money, is the usual fallback position. But here's the thing, uh, Presiding Officer. If you invest in education, you're investing in health, you're investing in justice, you're investing in welfare and the economy. Yes, the economy that is required to pay uh, for all the services that we need. To me, we need to define the issues we are trying to address. In education, that would be poor physical and mental health, declining behavioural standards, declining attendance, the attainment gap, as well as hunger and malnutrition. Today, we are talking about free school meals for all primary school children. I have to say, if we're tackling malnutrition and hunger for children coming into school, why are we not talking about free school breakfasts? Logic tells me that's the meal that we should be targeting, although I would also say that I'm not against having free school lunches for those children from the most deprived areas also. What I would say is if we want to, the uptake of free school meals to improve and the queues outside the chip shop to go down, then we need to offer pupils more reasons to be there. I have put forward the idea of offering some kind of activity prior to the school day starting that happens to have breakfast included. Extracurricular activities at lunchtime keeping children in school and active. These initiatives tackle all the issues I've previously highlighted and the costs associated with them. To me, the approach from the Scottish Government is one of crisis management rather than tackling the long-term needs of our educational environment. They have been funding increases in salary by cutting support staff and, yes, reneging on a manifesto promise like free school meals. But I haven't got time, I'm afraid. Presenting officer, ploughing this uh, furrow just digs a deeper and deeper hole for our educators, heaping ever more responsibility onto our already stretched teachers. It's increasingly obvious that in SNP Scotland, if you're not academically inclined, school offers less and less for our pupils. Sport, art, music, drama are all in decline with all the mental and physical health benefits that delivers. I know the SNP want to cut back on school meal provision. It is a false economy. It will disincentivise pupils further, leading to more ab absenteeism, unhealthier pupils, poorer behaviour and a widening attainment gap. The biggest inequality is the inequality of opportunity. And this decision by the SCP government is just another element of that inequality. So instead of delivering the rounded education we desire, we see short-termism ter that will just hand on the problems to the next government. At some point, we need to halt this continuous decline in our public sector and recognise that by getting education right, we can start tackling all the other crises the SNP have presided over. Sir. Presided over. 
Education used to be the SNP's number one priority. Unfortunately, when they failed to deliver on that pledge, they just moved on to another of their priorities, leaving our education system much worse off than when they inherited it. The opposition parties may not agree with some of the solutions that I put forward, and that is perfectly acceptable, as long as they come up with their own solutions. But as we know, the SNP solution is inevitably yet another consultation that leads to yet more inaction. It won't do, presenting officer. Cutting school meals is yet another symptom of a Scottish Government without a clue. Presiding officer. Thank you. I now call George Adam to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Up to four minutes, Mr Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. Presiding officer, here I find myself back in the back benches, freed from the shackles of government, being able to say what I really mean and what I really want to say. Yes. And you're all going to be extremely disappointed because sometimes I find opposition business extremely tedious. Because here we have the classic attempt the classic attempt to get that gotcha moment to talk down the government and to give no ideas about delivery, no ideas about what they would do. We used to, you'll remember this, presiding officer, we used to discuss the big ideas here during all parts of this uh, chamber's duties of business. We used to talk about it all the time, but no longer. It just seems to be this very simple gotcha, uh, trying to get the next headline from the opposition parties. Liam Kerr went and said, you know, put party politics aside. And, President <laughs> Officer, I'd quite gladly do that. If people genuinely want to work with me and others in the SNP to make that difference to young people's lives, I would say, let's go for it. And then he goes into the most partisan political speech I think I've heard for quite some time. <laughs> Free school meals are there to support many families who are struggling. And I'm happy to work with the government and others to achieve all our ambitions on school meals. But this is more than just an academic discussion for me, because from my background, my family are from Fege, which for the official report, that's actually Fergusley Park in Paisley. And it's an area that has had its challenges with uh, poverty over the years. And that's what this is all about. I'm here to represent the people of Paisley and to actually represent these people that I have grown up with all the time. And Paisley, uh, Fergusley Park, like other parts of Paisley in Scotland, has had to deal with the challenges with little support from successive UK governments. The Scottish Government has invested and supported these families uh, as much as they can do. A perfect example of that is £400 million worth of measures such as the Scottish Child Payment, which has brought 100,000 children out of poverty. These are things that the Government has to do to focus on while dealing with the constraints of the Westminster Settlement. The problem is the Scottish Government aren't who uh, can't keep propping up continual failing UK governments. As I've already stated, our ongoing challenge in Scotland is to continually be pampered by successive UK governments. Surely with the full powers of independence, we could change all of our children's future for the better and moving away from the usual 14 years of Westminster failure on top of decade after decade of failure from Westminster. Keir Starmer is in two weeks and he's chucked it already and he says things can only get worse. But the SNP vision is greater than that. Where Westminster says the, the game's a bogey, we might as well chuck it. We offer hope. We want to empower the people of Scotland and make their own decisions on the future. Even with the devolution settlement, the SNP have still managed to bring 100,000 children out of poverty, while Tory, Labour, Westminster accelerates further austerity. Presiding officer, I'm here to represent the great town of Paisley, as you may have guessed, and its many buddies. They're my people, it's my town, and it's my place in the world. Where Westminster offers more of the same, myself and my colleagues in the SNP offer hope. Where they say things can only get worse, we say there is another way. And I hope, presiding officer, we get closer down that road to independence and make things better for the people of Scotland. Thank you. I now call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Liz Smith. Up to four minutes, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, in 2021, the First Minister, then Education Secretary, said free school meals were a landmark policy. Successive First Minister committed and recommitted to the policy. These empty promises are now coming home to roost. If it's not school meals, it is the pledge to give an electronic device to every child, which then became each household 
being cancelled. Is the pledge to give bikes to children in poverty cancelled after only 6,800 were delivered, less than 3% of the 250,000 children in poverty? The Scottish Government promised an increase in the teachers and teaching assistant numbers by 3,500. We now have 250 less. Make no mistake, our children are suffering because of these failures. While we have had the SNP government, standards have undoubtedly fallen education. The PISA result from the last year made it clear as day. Our science and math scores were 515 and 506 in 2006. They have fallen to 483 and 471. The poverty-related attainment gap grew in the most recent exam results. For a government who seemingly see this is a priority, it should be a mark of shame. Another broken promise on increasing non-contact time by 90 minutes in placing teachers under more pressure. A WPI economic report found this would only be possible with raising teacher numbers. They are now falling. 20% of teachers are living during their provision year, many reporting stress as a factor. Children will see the consequences of these broken promises with large classes and overworked teachers. This will only serve to, uh, to entrench inequalities and increase the attainment gap in the SNP uh, say they want to eliminate. The Social Attitude Survey this year showed trust in the Scottish Government as the lowest it has ever been. U-turns such as this are following that perception. The public want the Scottish Government to succeed, to be able to improve people's lives. But announcing policies then going back on them is eroding the trust. When the politicians make promises and fail to deliver, it not only reflects badly on the government, it reflects badly on all of us. We must understand the headlines are not a replacement for good governments. Government should do what they say, not overpromise, then cry full when they are unable to deliver. We need a tangible action to give children the best start in life. A real living wages to ensure their parents have money to put food on the table. An end to zero hour contracts for stable work. Lower energy bills, not at the mercy of global market. That is how you truly deliver. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call uh, Liz Smith to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Up to four minutes. Uh, thank Smith. you. The Cabinet Secretary said in her speech that she wanted some context and to engage uh, with the opposition. So, like Willie Rennie, can I just take her uh, back a little bit in this journey? Most especially about how opinions have changed over time. When I was first elected to this Parliament in 2007, the very first committee session that I went to on the Education Committee was a debate about whether free school meals were necessary and if they were, on what basis. We took extensive, and I have to say, very interesting and in some cases surprising evidence, uh, not just from Scotland, where we, I remember a, a big study from Hull City, uh, about whether this was the right thing to do. And at that time, in 2007, the Aberlour Child Care Trust warmly welcomed the committee's engagement, but they said this, that the trust is yet to be convinced about universal school meals. Bernardo's said the same. And Tam Bailey, who was Children's Commissioner at the same time, he said, and I quote, I'm not at all sure that introducing free school meals would be the best way of achieving the desired objective amongst our most vulnerable children. And he also said that many felt that the problems that we were trying to address as a committee would be far better with the earliest years and not necessarily those further up primary school. That was then, and this is now. 14 years on, it is my very strong view that tackling the problems of unhealthy eating amongst our school children, for all the reasons that Brian Whittle set out, should be a major priority within this session of Parliament. Which is, I, I, will, I will in a minute, which is why, presumably, 
the SNP made that manifesto commitment that it did in 2021. And it did make that promise. And that is what we are debating this afternoon. Because, as we all know, election promises are very important. If voters are attracted to them, as they were for the SNP, then it is wrong to remove that promise. And if the SNP can't see that, then they need only look at the general election when other parties, mine included, were soundly taken uh, apart when it came to some of the promises that we had broken. What matters here, of course, is the health of our young people. Yeah. Evidence consistently shows that children uh, with Scotland's public health is very poor indeed. And it also shows that there is a very strong link between poor health and poor attainment. And my goodness, the current state of attainment in Scotland is nothing of which to be proud. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there are several uh, issues to be debated here. Are free breakfasts better than free lunches? At what age do pupils see the best results? Is universalism the way forward? What do we do about the significant waste of food that far too many of our dining rooms in schools actually see every day? These are all important questions, but for the purpose of this debate this afternoon, the SNP made a clear and unequivocal promise, and to suddenly remove it is both disingenuous and deeply worrying to the parents who are finding it difficult to make ends meet. And on that basis, I'm supporting the motion in the name of Liam Kerr. Thank you. I now call Evelyn Tweed up to four minutes. Ms Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. No child should go to school hungry, and I think this is something we can agree across the chamber today. I grew up receiving free school meals, and I know how important they are to life chances. Coming from a very poor background, they were essential for my development in every way. But to be clear, universal school meals have not been axed, and currently the Government provides free school meals for nearly 278,000 pupils. The Scottish Government is reducing the cost of the school day by saving families £400 per child per year. This provision is being expanded even further to those in primary six and seven in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment. The decision to delay universal rollout beyond the 2026 target is one that has not been made lightly. And we must consider the financial backdrop of why such a decision was made. It's impossible to explain the choices made in Scotland without looking to the finite and unpredictable budget handed down from Westminster each year. It's impossible to divorce the size of this budget from the economic situation in the UK, which has been damaged by years of austerity, the catastrophe of Brexit and the 49 days of Liz Truss. To place blame squarely on the Scottish Government is to deliberately and disingenuously obscure the national and the international context. Successive Westminster governments blame their predecessors for the conditions which they have inherited, and so justify austerity. But austerity is a political choice. Since 2019, the Scottish Government has spent £750 million to directly mitigate UK policies such as the bedroom tax and two-child benefit cap in order to protect our constituents from draconian policies introduced by the Conservatives and now continued by Labour. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, to be in a position where the rollout of universal free school meals must be delayed is deeply upsetting to me. But we must work together cross party, cross government to find solutions not only to the current financial situation facing Scotland and the UK, but solutions to poverty and inequality more broadly. The Scottish Parliament's think tank, the Futures Forum, discussed this very issue last night, the issue of inequality, with wide-ranging views and passion. But one thing was clear. We need to work together to tackle inequality. We have been elected to make people's lives better, not participate in a race to the bottom. Austerity has left the poorest even poorer, and yet the wealth of the rich soars. 
The richest 1% of Britons hold more than 70% of the population combined, and 60% of the public think that the rich are not being taxed enough. The Chancellor has been hinting at large cuts ahead without providing the detail necessary to plan appropriately. And I fear that this may be the first of many difficult decisions, but it doesn't have to be. The predecessors of our Labour colleagues founded the welfare state. They believed that those in need should have a safety net, and now their Westminster colleagues have the power to end austerity should they choose to. Universality is the goal if we work together. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches. I call first Ross Greer up to four minutes. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government made a welcome commitment in its programme for government last week, and that was that eliminating child poverty or tackling child poverty would continue to be one of its top priorities. The challenge I find, though, is how the government expects to hit its existing child poverty targets whilst rolling back on the very commitments that were key to doing so. I will acknowledge the Scottish Government's budget is, frankly, hopelessly overcommitted, and no party in Parliament's hands are clean on that. We have all made extensive spending demands of the government. My party in our time in government secured a number of those and have contributed towards this. And far too often these debates in Parliament, especially when it's about an issue that we all actually agree on when it comes to the policy, involve quite a lot of fantasy finances. And I said before my frustration at other opposition parties for not putting forward proposals. But I am also frustrated at the government's line this afternoon that it is somehow powerless to act in this situation. That is not true. And I want to run through some of the proposals that the Scottish Greens would make for how we could fund this. And I do not expect there will be widespread agreement for many of these, but these are our position on how we could afford a policy we acknowledge is expensive. In the first instance, we would reform and reduce the overall scale of the small business bonus scheme. That is a quarter of a billion pounds a year. And we all acknowledge that many of the businesses in receipt of it are not small businesses. They are large and profitable businesses, as the government's own review found. They are simply in low-value property. As I mentioned earlier, between three and five million pounds of that scheme alone every year goes to shooting estates, giving them tax breaks. We could condition additional tax breaks on companies meeting fair work and climate standards. At the very least, that would give savings for a few years while those companies made the necessary changes to hit those standards. We could increase the additional dwelling supplements, so we are raising more from those with the good fortune to be able to afford a second or holiday home. We could introduce a levy excuse me, on supermarkets who sell alcohol and tobacco. The Fraser Valander Institute's model for that says it would raise just under £60 million a year. Granted, those in the alcohol uh, health uh, charity sector have pushed for that, believe it should be spent in that area in particular. You could equally argue that spending on something like free school meals is preventative health spend. We could lower the threshold for advanced and higher rates of income tax. That would raise a considerable amount. We could stop standardised tests. That would save us about £5 million a year on the contract with the company that provides <coughs> Those. And I would note that Parliament has voted before to end standardised testing, at least in primary at one, and yet that still takes place. We could stop providing grants and other forms of support through our enterprise agencies for the arms dealers who are currently funding the Israeli genocide in Gaza. We could give new powers to councils, like a demolition levy, the carbon emission land tax. That would allow them to raise money to fund this directly. We could update council tax valuations from 1991. 1991, before I was even born, and yet uh, that is the foundation of our second most significant form of taxation in Scotland. We could save a fortune by diverting all those who do not need to be in prison to community sentencing options instead. I could get really niche here. I am sure everybody is thrilled already, but we could repeal Section 55 of the 1984 Road Traffic Regulation Act. That ring fences parking fine proceeds only for public transport and road network purposes. If you take away the ring fencing, you can spend it in other areas like this. I think all parties should put forward proposals, perhaps in a more interesting and invigorating way than I just have, but it would help Parliament if we were all honest about how we expect to fund this. I disagree with the Conservatives' constant attacks on the Scottish Government's international offices. I think they provide value, but they have at least proposed a saving there. It is more than cancelled out by the tax cuts that they would bring in. 
The Scottish Greens are honest, though. We want universal free school meals, and we want them up to S6. That's why our amendment called for the pilot in high schools to be completed. That is an expensive policy, but we've laid out a range of options for how we would pay for it. We all agree, at least on the principle of universal provision in primary school, but this debate this afternoon I don't think has taken us any further forward in the key question, which is how we can afford to do it. Thank you. I now call uh, Martin Whitfield again. Up to four minutes, Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And this has been the very canteen in high schools as people rush through this debate with their four-minute slots. But there have been some very interesting contributions that I want to pick up on. But let's start by going all the way back, not quite to Liam Kerr, my apologies, but to the Cabinet Secretary and congratulating the debating team winners. Um, it is important that our young people see that their successes are celebrated. And I am slightly disappointed that the SNP government can't agree this motion. And we've heard a number of um, speeches that go around it. And to address towards the end Evelyn Tweed's contribution about the fact that the Scottish Government are reducing the cost of the school day, and it's impossible to separate the choices without looking at the UK. I think there's a step before that, which is what this motion has actually been about and what today to disagree um, with Mr Adam, although it is welcome to see him unfettered again on the back benches to contribute. This debate has been about what it means to promise, to promise in a manifesto, to promise in speeches, to promise in debate. This is about... I will, simply from the courtesy of the way it has been asked for. Briefly, well, Christine Graham. At last I've been called courteous. I think you've just walked into a bear trap. The great big promise from Anna Sarah was no austerity under Labour. How is that for a broken promise? Martin Whitfield. And again, you talk to the heart of what an interesting debate this afternoon has been about cross-party, about we will always hold to the highest level others, but to our own we will forgive. The Scottish Government promised young people free... No. The Scottish Government promised young people free school meals. A promise to assure someone, to assure someone that you will definitely do something. I had the great privilege at lunchtime of sitting at a round table listening to people discussing promises that have not been kept, and what the effect on those people were, what the effect on them to be told something was going to appear, strangely enough, in the programme for government, but has been omitted. And here we are debating about a promise the Scottish Government made, not once, not twice, but on many occasions, a promise that is supported across the House about the importance to look at Liz Smith's very powerful contribution about the movement in the view and the value of free school meals from where we were in 2007 to where we are now. There are children you promised, my apologies, Deputy Presiding Officer, there are children the Scottish Government promised a free school meal. They promised, they assured them, we will keep we will definitely do something. And you cannot now deliver that. And you now want to address it in challenges from other places. And a variety of contributions have pointed to the UK government down the road failing to support. Others have pointed to, to other areas. But the reality is, did the Scottish government mean to keep that promise when it was made? Because it's failed to keep that promise. The lived experience of our young children is of a government that has had promises on bicycles, as mentioned by my colleague Faisal Chowdhury, on iPads, on smaller class sizes, on more teachers. It is a promise that the SNP Scottish Government have failed to keep. And maybe, maybe more thought should have been... I'm unfortunately unable to take time in this vast canteen of delivery and debate. Maybe the Scottish Government should stand up and say what consideration they actually gave before they made that promise, which they are now unable to keep. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary up to five minutes, please. OK. Uh, Presiding Officer, this afternoon's debate uh, had the potential to shine a light on how minority government can work with opposition to deliver improvements for our 
Young people, I, I think at, at times it failed to live up to that expectation, but, but nonetheless, I want to respond to some of the points that have been made in um, quite a frenetic at times debate this afternoon, but a really important debate nonetheless. And Ross Greer spoke to the, the Finnish example of free school meal provision and the impacts that he and I think Oliver Mundell observed on improved learning outcomes for, for young people in Finland. And I'm delighted that he and Mr Mundell benefited from that overseas opportunity. Um, of course, as Education Secretary, I don't quite get the opportunity to engage with international travel. But I was in Dundee this morning. And uh, whilst in Dundee, um, I met with a number of teachers and a number of young people. And I, I talked to them about their experience of the cost of living crisis in that school. And Pam Duncan Glancy spoke to schools being on their knees. And to some extent, I would agree with that assertion. Schools today in Scotland, like the one I visited this morning in Dundee, have food banks. They have clothing banks. They have staff supporting families with the exorbitant costs associated with increases in terms of their heating bills. That is austerity in our schools. And it's being supported, or challenged rather, by support from this government. So extra funding from this government, from the school clothing grant, the a billion pound investment through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, it's funding to remove core curriculum charges. Now, uh, sorry, I see Monica Lennon would like to come in. Monica Lennon, briefly. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, we don't need to go international to find good practice. Inverclyde, for example, is a Scottish local authority that has rolled out universal free school meals to all primary pupils. We've got examples of local producers, young people with ideas. Um, we heard at the, the round table that we held together, Cabinet Secretary, that many councils are ready to go, but we need leadership, we need some direction, and we need a wee bit of pulling people together. Cabinet Secretary. Will she pick up the phone? to some of those who are doing it already. Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm more than happy to engage with them. I, I appreciate the members' interest in this. We've worked well on the issue uh, in the past. Um, but I think what I haven't heard from the opposition thus far, with the exception of Ross Greer this afternoon, are any credible contributions in terms of where that funding gap of £256 million will come from. Now, Willie Rennie believes that Graham Day has the £256 million up his sleeve. Now, I've checked. It's not there. So that's not quite <laughs> accurate. He goes on to introduce the SNP without offering me uh, an answer on the exam question set. And what is our context in Scotland, presiding officer? That context matters. A block grant cut for capital of nearly 9%, meaning £1.3 billion less for Scotland. Look, I hear the Unionist parties uh, heckling from a sedentary position. This is their union. They should take ownership of these cuts coming to Scotland. A £1.2 billion cut that we're having to fund to mitigate Westminster austerity on things like the bedroom tax. Inflationary pressures largely driven by Liz Truss's disastrous 49 days in office. That context, well, I hear anger from the Conservative fences. This is their union. They should own it. Because that context is what the Unionist parties have bequeathed to the children of Scotland. The Scottish Government are in a financial straitjacket. And it's never, there is never a scintilla of recognition that maybe, just maybe, decisions taken elsewhere are, happen, are har har harming the decisions rather taken in this parliament. But let's listen to some of the organisations that are involved with child poverty, because we discussed them last week at length, presiding officer. As CPAC have noted, Holyrood policies are working, but the UK government must also invest in social security to reverse long-term damage to living standards, starting by scrapping the two-child limit and benefit cap and restoring restoring the value of child benefit. I did not see or hear any commentary on either of those issues this afternoon, presiding officer. Now, Liz Smith is right to point to the dial shifting on free school meals. And I think it's fair to say her party have been on somewhat of a journey on this topic. And indeed, of course, I note some of the comments from her former colleagues, Ben Bradley, back in 2020, who, when someone tweeted at him about free school meals, said £20 cash direct to your crack den and brothel really sounds like the way forward. But this one, Bradley responded, that's what free school meal vouchers in the summer effectively did. <laughs> and Mark Jenkinson, who was the former MP for Workington, who said, I know in my constituency that as a tiny minority as it might be, food parcels are sold or traded for drugs. So yes, the Conservative Party have been on a journey in relation to their views on free school yeah. meals, presiding officer. Uh, I'm conscious Mr Kerr would like to make an intervention. I think I have five seconds school, so I will not be taking his intervention, presiding officer. It's very clear, presiding officer, that while Westminster takes away, this SNP Scottish Government is investing in Scotland's future, with child poverty rates lower than the UK average, and the Scottish Government policies like the Scottish Child 
payment, helping to keep an estimated 100,000 children out of relative poverty this year. Investment in the school clothing grant, worth up to £150 per child. The removal of core curriculum charges driving down the cost of the school day. Presiding officer, I could go on, but I look forward to engaging with the Conservatives and, of course, the Labour Party on these issues through the budget process and on how they intend to meet that £256 million budget gap to deliver fully Thank universality and free school meals Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Rose McCall to wind up the debate. Up to six minutes, Ms McCall. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to close this debate on the Scottish Conservative Party business on school meals for all primary school pupils in Scotland. I'm going to start, though, by just saying that I have heard from the SNP and the Cabinet Secretary repeatedly where money should come from. And so solutions and comments have been given, but the problem is that the suggestions are unpalatable to them. So the response is therefore to deny that they are coming. Mr Kerr gave a, a fair selection of them and I'm going to do more here and so did Mr Greer. But selections are um, unpalatable, so therefore they are stated that they are unforthcoming and that is not simply just not the case. The Scottish Conservatives were the first party to include this. In fact, it was in our manifesto in September 2020 when we proposed to expand free school meals to all primary school pupils. I, on the fact that we had it in our, in our manifesto, please. Jackie uh, Dunbar, briefly. Thank you, for presiding officer, and I thank the member for, for taking the intervention. It's some clarification. Um, can I ask the member uh, to clarify if the Conservatives are keen to put food in all our bairns bellies or just the first two in a family? Because I do realise that they are still for the two children. Rose cat. McCall. And it was in our manifesto in 2020. Um, I was glad to see the SNP followed suit shortly after that when the First Minister announced the same policy at the SNP conference and at the 21 SNP manifesto. A promise that was made to the electorate not only in that conference and at the manifesto but backed up by the First Minister at the time, Hamza Youssef, and the Scottish Government's programme for government in 2023-24. When the government stated it would work with COSLA in the coming year to prepare schools and infrastructure for the expansion of universal free school meal provision to all primary six and primary seven. It's therefore disappointing that the SNP have rolled back on their promise. Yet again, we see commitments made that are then withdrawn. It's now a pattern. Too many times we've witnessed this SNP government continue to promise with definitive statements and then to under deliver. I'm going to take a couple of minutes, well, even that, to just highlight a couple. And as usual, there was an excellent contribution from my colleague Liz Smith. And I note that back in 2007, Bernardo's were unsure about the rollout of free school meals, which is a stark contrast to Bernardo's report this morning, highlighting food insecurity and a concern over not expanding school meals to all primary school pupils. That's quite a change. And I do echo her comments that unhealthy eating for children should be seen as a major priority. We also had very uh, competent comments on breakfasts and that that should be included. That was from Pam Duncan Glancy, Liam Kerr, Brian Whittle and Liz Smith. And that is certainly something that I think should be discussed further. I thought it was interesting from Brian Whittle that investing in our education is investing in health, is investing in our economy and therefore is investing in our future. And Mr Rennie stated the will of Parliament is important. So I guess we'll just need to wait and see what happens later. Presiding officer, broken promises is what this debate is about today. It's more than just school meal rollout, as important as that is. The SNP in their motion have again cited funding constraints, which is halting their ability to stand by their word. One would assume that any manifesto pledge would be fully costed. One would also assume that the priority placed on manifesto pledges was sacrosanct. But it seems that some pledges are more important than others. There's been no funding cuts for independence papers and staff, so that manifesto is priority. Why don't we look at year-on-year -year mismanagement? £300 million wasted on HMP Berlini's replacement going over budget. £27.6 million wasted on Scotland's census in 2022 due to delays and deadline extensions. £57.6 million wasted in the SNP government on overdue ferries at Ferguson Marine and 13 million wasted on admin for the National Care Service Bill, which we wouldn't actually uh, agree with. 
To spin the financial pressures on the Scottish Government as Westminster austerity is simply not correct, and the electorate are wise to it. The SNP over the last 17 years has boldly stated its intention with definitive statements. It was not that long ago that education was the watchword. Education was the answer to Scotland's problems. We've all heard the defining mission to close the attainment gap, which then became the poverty-related attainment gap. And then in the announcement from, at that time, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon on her government's education record when she stated, let me be clear, I want to be judged on this. Well, I do judge the former First Minister on this, and I believe she has been found wanting. We are now told the Scottish Government will eradicate child poverty. Another bold statement. But if they cannot commit to their promise to roll out school meals to all primary pupils, then I believe that's deceitful. And I urge members to vote for our motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. That uh, concludes the debate on uh, free school meals for all primary pupils. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.